Okay. Um, Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Great. Okay, so uh, before we start the session, I would like to introduce this organization, what, what we do and why we exist. Um, Bhutan Economists, BE from now on, is a collective formed in 2020 to create a sanctuary or a safe space is what people prefer nowadays. Uh, a sanctuary for students of economics from marginalized communities. The group tries to gather support, not just academically, but morally as well. We have had collaborations amongst our members and we hope to have more of such. Um, we all are particularly interested in diversity and inclusion. Uh, pluralism is the talk of the decade and we all speak of it. But uh, as noble as it sounds, or they sound, they are very broad terms. Dialogues on diversity and inclusion are centered around the North and South divide, race, gender, methodologies, and so on, which we are all for. But to contextualize India, there are layers to unpack or to unfurl. Um, India has a long standing history of casteism, which meant a person's mobility is restricted by which caste a person is born into, much like the feudal order in feudal order during the Middle Ages. A person's hierarchical position at the time of birth determines what a person can do and cannot do in life. And uh, certain castes have been denied education for centuries, and some groups of people have been neglected for decades. And uh, as a result, the, these groups and castes have been far behind in the race. We, we don't see outright denial in the present day anymore, but the existing social structure does not allow easy assimilation. And this is where PE comes in. We try to create a friendly environment for all of us to come together to support and to collaborate with each other in the process of placing ourselves on the map. And uh, along with our attempt to increase our representation in research, the group's objective is also to put forward our perspective that is absent in the field. And we hope to create a space in economics that is inclusive of historically marginalized groups in India. And most of our, and one of our most ambitious dreams is to have more Dalit and tribal women economists. Uh, we as a group have organized sessions that will help students in the job market as well as research. We have had Python classes, statistics, and Stata classes, sessions on spoken English, admission abroad series, and so on, with the aim of equipping students with tools that will help them academically. And we try to provide guidance especially to the first and second generation learners, which we mostly are. Uh, we are more than a group that vouches for pluralism. Ours is very intimate, very personal. We are a volunteer-based organization. And the one particular principle that binds us all together or that uh, inspires us all to come together and work together is that we want to create a space uh, or an environment that is better than what we had. We've all had unpleasant experiences because of our position in the social hierarchy. And the desire to create a better space or a more friendly environment comes from um, not wishing the same experiences on another person who is yet to walk this path. So uh, it's very intimate and very personal. Um, that's pretty much about our organization. Um, let's get back to why we are here today. Uh, we have two resource persons, Stephen Lamb and Nithan Jain. Nithan Jain. Stephen Lamb is the Associate Director of Faculty Services at Booth and works closely with research associates and is actively working to promote employee welfare professional development and wider outreach. Uh, Stephen will introduce the possibilities and opportunities 
at Booth and Nidhan Jain, who is a research professional at Booth, will share his experiences. I think we have a good mix, a good combination um, in a very economic term. We will get a taste of both theory and practice in some sense. Um, the, floor, the screen is yours, Stephen. Over to you. Thank okay. you very much. And as someone working at the University of Chicago, I'll try and see if we can uh, infuse some practice into this conversation and not just theory. Um, so my name is Stephen Lamb. I work at Chicago Booth and with our group of research professionals. Uh, we have about 80 of these pre-doctoral uh, researchers here uh, at, at just at Booth at the University. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to go through some of the uh, administrative nuts and bolts, sort of describing what these positions are how they work in the academic pipeline. And then I'll uh, hand it over to Nidan, who actually has this role currently at Booth and has for the past two years, and can talk about his experience actually uh, working in this role. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And if for some reason, sometimes my slides don't move, if they don't soon, please do let me know. So these, what we call research professionals at Booth and what are more generally called uh, pre-docs or pre-doctoral scholars are a fairly new feature uh, to the field of economics. They've uh, been growing uh, at pace for about the last five years. They are a new potential opportunity within the pipeline, the academic pipeline for people who are considering research careers. And there are certain benefits to the RP experience that uh, I want to, to highlight here. What they are is essentially an opportunity to get a sneak peek at the academic research environment, to get a very close look to see how research is conducted, uh, working very close with faculty who are doing, uh, who are doing the actual research, uh, to gain skills that may be valuable uh, primarily for PhD applications, but sometimes also for other career options, and all as a paid opportunity. It can often be difficult uh, for someone who may not feel that they're ready or who is uncertain as to whether they want to do to go forth into a research career uh, to take on the burden of going straight into a PhD program, you know, a, a five to six year commitment on a student stipend. These are employed positions uh, that typically last for two years. So there's less of a cost associated with exploring whether uh, a research career might be something that you're interested in. If in the course of doing this job, one discovers that they are interested in going on to a PhD, the pre-doc experience can be an important credential for the PhD application process. Working closely with uh, high profile faculty means that those faculty can then write recommendation letters which have a position of outsized importance in the PhD application process. It also provides very important research experience which can not just help as a credential toward the PhD application process, but as actual experience and skill building, that'll be useful once one is a PhD student really to hit the ground running and to make the most of that experience. Ultimately, uh, an RP ship, a pre-doc ship is not necessary for everyone. It's not necessary for anyone, but it is a particularly good fit for people who may be uncertain whether they're re ready for graduate school, if they think they need a few more skills, or if they're not sure if a research career is something that they want, it's a wonderful way to find out. To speak more specifically about the RP program here at Chicago Booth, we have, uh, it's actually increased since I wrote this slide, it's about 80 research professionals working with faculty in multiple areas, which you can see here. One of the benefits about working at a business school rather than an economics department is the multidisciplinarity. Uh, we do have economists, we hire a lot of economists, but we also have sociologists and historians, we have computer scientists and statisticians. Uh, it used to be a convention at uh, the Booth School that when a faculty member was assigned an office, the people on each side of them had to be in a group different from them to try and force interdisciplinary conversation. We don't use that geography anymore, uh, but the ethos is still very much there here and at many other business schools that it's a place of the quantitative social sciences, very broadly speaking, and that can be a really stimulating uh, research environment. Uh, the primary benefit that a research professional tends to get from their experience is the relationship with their faculty supervisor, with their principal investigator or PI. Uh, but we do our best because we have such a large group of uh, research professionals 
to create uh, programming for them and a real cohorting experience so that they can build other relevant skills. So for instance, many of our research professionals decide that they would like to take some classes, either as preparation for graduate school or for general knowledge. We provide tuition assistance for so that people can take those classes. We provide introductory coding workshops and more advanced topics through different offices at our central university. Academic writing workshops, some particularly tailored to the PhD application process, some more general about academic writing. Uh, research workshops, both uh, faculty research workshops that our pre-docs attend uh, to see some of the cutting edge research in different fields, and workshops at which the research professionals themselves have an opportunity to present and to practice those skills. We have mentorships programs between former research professionals, often who've gone on to graduate school and our current research professionals, training on unconscious bias and bystander intervention, lunch and learns with senior faculty at Booth. We do the best that we can to make sure that the research professionals that we have here at Booth have the opportunity to take full advantage of the incredible intellectual environment we have at the University of Chicago. And I wanted to provide, I said earlier that one of the benefits of being at a business school was the interdisciplinary nature of the research and the fact that it's the quantitative social sciences more broadly and not just pure economics. Just to give you a quick rundown of some of the recent research uh, that our faculty have done. Uh, Sindhu Mullanathan with his Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence uh, put out a still fairly recent paper in science about how racial bias was affecting a major healthcare algorithm. Uh, we have faculty working on whether brands benefit from co-branding or not, sort of uh, uh, combating some of the major myths around, around that literature. Um, plenty of research surrounding COVID, so we had some of our operations faculty looking at uh, how New York City in particular could have a phased open back when the conversation was very much everything on or everything off. And then our accounting group looking at uh, how seemingly innocuous or uh, Byzantine rules about different accounting procedures could actually have significant effects uh, in policy in terms of the ability of people to get certain types of loans. So I've talked a little bit about how pre-doc positions are relatively new in the academic pipeline. And there's a quick visualization here uh, to indicate uh, how we see this working. One of the things I want to emphasize is that this is not a necessity for people who are interested in a PhD. It is not sort of this tax that we've placed on time to degree. It is a tool for people who feel that they may need more experience or for people who are uncertain about the path to take advantage of before they go on to the PhD if that's what they choose. And this graphic hopefully also illustrates the degree to which there are people who do this experience and because they went in uncertain about whether they wanted the PhD, ultimately decided not to go into a PhD. We have the strong majority of our pre-docs do choose to go on to PhDs and they tend to place very well, but we do have some who choose other careers. So we've had people go on to work at the European Central Bank or their, their uh, home country central bank. We've had people go on into other policy roles, uh, people who've gone on to industry who become say data science consultants. And while these roles are not designed to prepare people for those roles per se, the overwhelming feedback that we've gotten through exit interviews and such indicates that they do feel that the role gave them some benefit as they moved on to these other opportunities. One of the myths that I'm hoping to dispel today during this presentation is the idea that an academic career is a, uh, constitutes a vow of poverty. I think that's a, an impression that's out there for a lot of people. No, you won't be making as much as you would as the head of a hedge fund at Goldman Sachs, but it does tend to be a comfortable life. And these are some of the statistics that show that um, work as a, research, as a research professor in a business school is something that, uh, that can keep one very comfortable. Going on to the application process, there tend to be two main recruiting periods. This is certainly true of Chicago Booth, and I'll say it's broadly true of the market for pre-docs in general. Applications are posted year round, but we see the largest spike in early fall, uh, typically recruiting people who are finishing their degrees, uh, though that's by no means a requirement, and then a second smaller spike in spring. These are typically for newly hired faculty. So faculty go on the market in the winter, Universities make their selections and offers in late winter and then in the spring, those new faculty who may have been promised uh, pre-docs to support their research will go on the market uh, searching for those. 
in addition to sort of the standard application, which is you know asking for materials like a CV, cover letter, transcript, uh, many people will be asked to complete a, a data task in an interview. The data task is becoming more and more common uh, in the application process to determine uh, someone's coding ability. These data tasks will vary by field. So for instance, someone working in, uh, for a behavioral science faculty member, for instance, it may be more important that they have skills surrounding field work and survey design than that they necessarily have really sharp status skills. Someone working for Professor Mullenothan in the Center for Applied AI is gonna be doing uh, some more robust coding. That said, uh, we have what we hope is a fairly representative uh, practice data task with sample solutions that we've put up on our website. And, uh, and once I hand the, uh, hand the screen over to Nidan, I will put uh, all these links in the, in the chat so you don't need to frantically take notes now. Um, there's also a link here if you'd like to hear more about the positions that we have coming up, you can sign up for a mailing list. And whenever we have a new position come up, uh, I will send you an email to let you know that it's live and that you can go and inspect it. And you can choose the field that you're interested in. So if you're interested in economics and finance and you really couldn't care less about the accounting positions, we won't spam you with the accounting positions. We are able to support visas at Booth uh, for the positions that we're offering. It's a highly individualized process, uh, so that also limits my ability to talk about exactly what we would do in any individual case. But I can give you a, a general sense of the strategy that we use. For those who have F1 OPT, we tend to exhaust that before moving on to a J1 Scholar Exchange. Uh, UChicago as an institution does not support the OPT STEM extension. It's not a class that we are able to support. Uh, more than half of our current pre-docs are here on some form of visa support, so it is something that we have the infrastructure to support well. Booth has its own specialist, someone other than me, who knows the visa process very well. The university has an Office of International Affairs, um, and the Booth School, the business school, separately retains a law firm, Kempster, uh, which it uses to uh, get expert advice and sometimes to, uh, to expedite certain applications. There's another resource that I want to stress for all of you that I hope that you go uh, check out and rely upon. It's the PREDOC Consortium. PREDOC is an acronym for Pathways to Research and Doctoral Careers. The University of Chicago is part of this consortium. Uh, on their website, they have an opportunities page where they do their best and are fairly effective at collecting all the different pre-doc opportunities, uh, certainly in the US and some even uh, outside of the United States. So that's a great resource so you don't have to go searching around to every individual institution that may be offering these sorts of positions, you can find them all in one place. And they also have a lot of uh, wonderful information and resources uh, to help you learn more about these positions and uh, to prepare for them. Uh, and other events, some information sessions like this one, uh, some uh, that, uh, for instance, a course that we're just uh, actually beginning to run today on quantitative social science research methods. Uh, so I encourage you to, to track, to go back to that website and to track the new events that are coming up. At this point, I would like to hand it over to Nidan, who's actually been doing this job and can speak to the experience uh, much better than I can. Thanks, Stephen. Um, thanks for having th thanks for having us over um, virtually. Um, I don't really have slides, so I'm just going to talk for a bit, and then maybe I can answer some of your questions. Um, so to give you a sense of my own background before I came here, I had um, I got a BA in economics from Delhi University, and then I worked for this place called ID Insight for two years, which basically does like development consultancy for all practical purposes. Um, after which I got a master's from LSE and decided that I want a bit more research experience before I fully commit to a PhD program. Um, so my entire point of applying um, to Chicago Booth was mostly to see if I have what it takes and whether I'm even interested in, a, in an academic um, line of work. Um, and surprise, surprise, I guess this is some selection bias, but like uh, I am going to be going on to do a PhD and I'll be starting at Chicago Booth um, this fall. Um, so I work for two professors here, uh, two labor economists. That was the field of work that I was interested in, and therefore I applied to work specifically with those two professors, amongst others. Um, and to give you a sense, I mean, I think RA experiences seriously differ across professors and across institutions. So you should obviously take everything with a pinch of salt and sort of 
um, I think it's important to appreciate there's a high degree of variance in experience. Um, but I work for two labor economists who are junior professors. They both started at Booth um, the same year that I started. Um, and I think that shaped a huge part of my experience because a lot of the projects that they were working on were early stage projects. So they were still coming up with new ideas. They were still working on their job market papers. So my involvement on that front was a little low because that was something that they were wrapping up. But on the flip side, I got a chance to really work on conceptualizing and sort of shaping some of the early stage projects, which was a lot more fun from an intellectual standpoint. Um, so some of the projects I've worked on, again, if I'm entirely honest, one thing that I was a little skeptical about was working at U Chicago specifically because it is the home of the Chicago school and all of that. And that's what that's the first thing we're exposed to as economic students. Um, happily, I worked on projects that were very much in line with ideas that I have about the world and things that interest me. So one of the projects I work on is um, how an effort to weaken teacher unions in the state of Wisconsin in the US has affected the gender wage gap amongst public school teachers. So that was one project that I was working on. Um, some other projects that I've been working on an early stage sort of still conceptualizing experiments around those um, are about how people update beliefs about when there's overlapping identities. So for example, if you've got minority students who are applying with highly qualified degrees, how people update their beliefs and repeated interactions um, in these situations where there's overlapping identities. Um, that's still an early stage project and that really hasn't kicked off, but it's been interesting to think about a bit more. Um, and then another project I've been working on is on charter schools in the US, which is a pretty contentious idea where um, they're essentially schools that receive public funding, but have a lot more autonomy in setting their own like disciplinary standards and their own curriculum and so on. Um, and I've basically been studying um, the impact of charter schools on a whole bunch of like economic outcomes um, six or seven years after graduation. Um, so that's like the sort of a bunch of projects that I've been working on. Um, I think I've been very happy with them and particularly so because I've been working with junior professors who are a lot more open to having some input from their RAs um, and so on. I think your experience really differs according to who you work with. I believe there's like massive trade-offs. Um, working with professors who've been around for a bit longer means that you might work in something that we've started to call um, like a, a lab environment. There's this rise of like economics research labs where there's a lot more collaboration and learning opportunities would be very different um, as an RA in the lab. You might learn a lot more from your peers. You might learn a lot more about like what's at the frontier of coding practice and version control and just general programming. Um, but my sense is that that might involve a little less like two-way interaction with your professors. That's something that differs. I have, this is purely anecdotal. Um, so that might, yeah, that might not necessarily hold true in all situations. Um, I think one of the best parts of this job is that because I came here to see if I actually wanted to do a PhD, um, the two things that really helped are that there's a staff benefit that you can take like classes for reduced tuition costs um, and you can still get a transcript and stuff. So it's not like you'll get a transcript that says University of Chicago, you did like a real analysis course and you got this grade. Uh, so it's like an official thing. It really helps in your applications. I did real analysis because I messed up my undergraduate real analysis exam. Other people do more interesting things. You can do like statistics classes, computer science classes, sociology, political science, anything is pretty much open. Any field that you'd like to work on, you can work on um, or you can study um, and you can get like grades for it. I believe, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe now earlier it used to be a 50% fusion discount. And now I believe your professor could potentially fund you and you could get the entire tuition cost waived. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I think that was super helpful, I believe. I feel that in a lot of ways, I might have wanted to do this before my master's um, just because I would get some credentials. And I'd also just like, this is a step that I would have perhaps personally liked to do before my master's. Uh, and a lot of people do that. I saw there was a question about age bar. There is no age bar. I think you just need to have like a bachelor's degree in the social science field. Um, a lot of the colleagues I work with are 
straight out of the undergrad degrees and stuff. So I don't think there's an age bar. You shouldn't worry about that. You should also not typically think this is a position only after your master's. Um, I would encourage you to think about it even before your master's if you would like to. Um, it just gives you a good sense of whether you want to stay in this field. Um, it also shapes your expectations going into your master's programs. Um, and you can get like, you can get grades and transcripts and stuff. The other thing I really enjoyed, which I did a lot more often, but perhaps not in a very disciplined manner, was um, I audited classes. And the difference between auditing a class and taking a class is that I didn't have to pay anything. I wasn't officially registered in the class. I just go sit in the classroom. Um, so I did this for a couple like PhD level courses just to see if I can, you know, if I do a PhD, can I survive this? How stressful is it going to be? How interesting are the classes? Um, I was also interested in seeing um, this is a good chance for you to like expand your borders a bit. If you if you mostly worked in labor economics, for instance, as in my case, and you decide that maybe you want to see if theory is your cup of tea and you really enjoy game theory or something like that, you can just audit a class. And this is a great time to sort of feel that out and explore your opportunities a bit more. I found that very helpful. Um, the other thing, the second thing that I was talking about that really helped me was um, as RAs at the University of Chicago, you have complete access to all of the workshops that are held. So to give you a sense of how the workshops are conducted, it's basically every department. So there are three, effectively, there are three economics departments at U Chicago. So there's the one, there's a core department of economics, there's the booth microeconomics group, and there's a booth macroeconomics group. And then there's also the Harris Public Policy School that has a bunch of economists there. Each of these departments have their own set of workshops on a weekly basis. And how these workshops um, work is that they'll invite either an internal researcher or somebody from other universities to basically fly in for a day and then present a piece of work that they've been working on lately that hasn't yet been published, that might not even necessarily have a working paper out there. Sometimes it is a paper that's already been submitted and they're looking for like comments um, to, to respond to like reviewer comments and stuff. But it's basically research at different stages that is presented to you on a weekly basis. And you can go and sit in and just hear what they have to say. And it gives you a good idea of what's happening at the frontier of like academic research. Um, I found that really helpful in general, mostly just to, as I said, it's one important part of this whole thing is to test out like, what kind of work interests you. And this is a very helpful way to find out what doesn't interest you. Like if you sit through a 45 minute or a one and a half hour talk and you're like, you leave it without thinking much about it. And by the end of the day, you don't really, it's not on your mind at all. And you forgot you even attended it. That's like a short, short sign that maybe monetary policy is not for you, which was my um, situation. Um, so I found that very helpful. And in general, so I think those are some of the differences in RA positions that are based at the university versus um, RA positions like JPAL. I feel like both of them have, that, that was one big question for me when I was leaving my undergrad. And when I was thinking about RA positions, um, there's a few RA positions in the US that sponsor visas. I believe Yale, I believe Chicago Booth, Princeton. These are some of the places that sponsor visas. So I had a list of like those places to apply to. And then obviously like the other big one was JPAL because that's, it's essentially become a research hub now. Um, and I believe, I personally feel given that my interest in development economics have moved on and I'm more of a labor economics person now, I feel that um, I'm, there were some massive benefits to being located physically in the university as opposed to being a field RA. I think that differs massively if you're a development econ economist. Field experience uh, is invaluable and it makes a huge difference. But to me personally, I feel I was quite happy being in the university because it made me sort of it exposed me to a lot more ideas that I, which is something I was looking for, given that I'm not entirely sure what my actual research interests are. Um, and yeah, I think the last thing I'd say is that this is also a great way to just meet future researchers. Like if you decide you want to continue in academia, um, you're going to meet a lot of other RAs here who are starting off their academic career with you. Um, the other thing I'd also emphasize is that working at a business school doesn't necessarily mean you'll end up at a business school. So a lot of, I think I might be the only person from my cohort here who's going to a business school for a PhD. A lot of other people are going to Northwestern, Stanford, Harvard, 
etc. I believe there's a few more. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to end up at a business school if that's something that you don't want to do for some reason. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about my day-to-day -day as an RA. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, another question you might have is about the salary. And I mean, it's hard to put that in context if you haven't lived in Chicago. Um, I, I feel it's a pretty comfortable salary. I, will, I could make rent and um, it's, to put it in context, it, it's more than a lot of PhD students get. I'm going to be taking a pay cut as I start as a PhD student. So it's a pretty healthy um, salary to have. And it also allows you to save up for all the admissions costs that await on the other side with like the GRE and like application costs and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some questions were answered before it was even asked. So uh, the one question we have is, what are, the, are some of the most important things you look at in the profile of an applicant? And what kind of experiences or skills can strengthen our candidature? I think I'll add another question. Most of us here in India do not have uh, a lot of experience with this computer languages and softwares and a lot of people don't have experience there. So uh, is there a way of learning in the process before application? Thank you. Stephen, do you want to take the first part of that? I've never actually evaluated an RE application, so. Sure. So there are a few things that people look for consistently. I will say that there's some heterogeneity just based on the, the individual professor. They can be looking for quite specific things for their own specific research process, uh, their own, the, only, the, the research that they have going on. Uh, that said, uh, there are a few things that we look for pretty universally. One is some competency in uh, quantitative methods and coding. The individual coding language isn't that important. For instance, if someone comes in with good R skills and that professor happens to use Stata, there's a general understanding that if you have strong coding fundamentals, you can pick up the Stata that you need once you're on the job. Um, so as long as you're able to, uh, to demonstrate competency in one language, that's really what's important. The other thing that people look for is research experience. That can be having worked as a part-time research assistant. It could be independent research that you've done, either a, a substantive paper for a class or a bachelor's or master's thesis. Um, so those two things really come in as, as strong indicators of success in the role. On the language front, I, if you, if you, not seriously work with the programming language, I'd recommend you pick up R. Um, I personally don't know R, but I feel like it's what you'd like to pick up because one, it's um, open source is completely free, which is really important because I'm ending my job um, end of July and I don't start my PhD until September. And that means I don't have a Stata license for two months. Um, so that's just a massive like handicap to have to deal with. So I'd highly recommend picking up all. Um, if you haven't, there's, I mean, one resource that I've come across a lot, and I think other people will have a lot more to add here than I do. But one resource that I think is very helpful and should at least get you through like a data task is this, uh, is this book by Hadley Wickham. It's completely free. It's online. I can send a link. Um, it basically covers all the basics from the ground up from like level one um, to like fairly complicated analysis. And I think that's all you really need for a data task. Um, so I can send that. Uh, Nita and I just put it in the chat. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I've never seen um, programming language work as like, knowing only one programming language has never been a constraint. My, there's um, a replacement who's going to be joining who will be replacing me as my professor's RA and um, she's only worked in R and my professor only works in Stata, but the understanding is that he'll pick it up along the way. Uh, 
hello. Yeah, I I I I think we, we, if we could uh, clarify the timeline bit a little more, that would be um, great. When does the application usually start? By when can you expect to hear from the uh, booth? Sure. So there are two main recruiting seasons. One, we start to put uh, applications out around September, and those start to really come out in force. Um, they begin to be reviewed in mid to late October. We try to get offers out by November, December. What we used to see is that a subset of the people who applied would then be assigned a data task, uh, which could be a, a substantive drop in time. Uh, a new trend that has been emerging is that professors have been trying to reduce the time that a data task takes, that they're not looking at as many highly technical details, which honestly could be taught on the job, and they're more interested in, in more difficult to teach things like communications ability or economic intuition. Um, and then that task, because it's e easier to grade and takes less time, can be assigned to everyone. So it's often put uh, uh, at the beginning of the process and people have more time to complete it. But generally, you're looking at making the initial application in September, hearing back if you've gotten into uh, the subset that'll be interviewed in October, or maybe early November, and hopefully uh, offers quickly to follow. There's a subsequent uh, period of application uh, in the spring. We often see those applications going out around February. They tend to follow the academic job market. So once professors have uh, been given offers at Booth and they accept, part of what we use to entice uh, faculty to come to Booth is to say that we will support their research by authorizing them to hire research professionals. So once they've accepted the offer, they tend to go straight into hiring those research professionals. That tends to be in February, March. Uh, the good news for those of you who are considering applying to PhD programs but would like the pre-doc as a backup is that these decisions tend to happen at the same time that you're hearing about PhD applications. So you would still be, say, applying in February, March. You'll hear back from the PhD programs around March, April, uh, but you'll still have the opportunity to continue on with those pre-doc applications and, and see how those do. Uh, so that can be a, a useful recruiting season for those who are uh, considering uh, applying to graduate school first and then keeping the pre-doc as sort of a, a backup. If you look at our, our data from this past year, you won't see that trend. That was uh, COVID specific. The University of Chicago didn't hire many new faculty this year just because of budgetary constraints. Uh, but in a normal year, that is that is the pattern that we see. Um, I had a quick question about um, the, I don't know if you want to take the question from Mithile. She's raised his hand while he's going to ask the question. Yeah, so is this the one about, uh, this is about applying with a BSc degree? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. All right. Yeah, I, I, I'm, my sense is that as long as you've got like you seem to have like computer science experience and some math experience i think like some math classes under your belt i think that should be perfectly fine i don't think it's restricted to um and stephen please correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think you have to have like a bachelor's in economics or political science or something like that i feel like as long as you've got some math classes with you um and you seem to have like research experience and computer science experience i think that's that should definitely um be valuable my sense. That's exactly right. As we're doing recruiting, we're actually trying to get the word out to areas other than just economics departments and under uh, economics undergraduates that these opportunities exist. So we're actively trying to recruit from other areas, people who have the necessary quantitative skills to do well here. Um, so a, a bachelor's degree, I've also seen some questions about whether a master's degree is required. Most of our current research professionals do not have a master's degree. Most of them have a bachelor's degree as their terminal degree. The one thing that I will state is that for some classes of visa support, you will need a four year uh, undergraduate degree. So if your undergraduate degree is classified as three years, then you would need an additional master's degree to be able to apply. So that's something to consider. But just in terms of the academic qualifications, a bachelor's degree is completely uh, acceptable. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Arushi. 
Um, yeah, I just had a, a question about the diversity policy of, at uh, in the hiring of pre docs at Chicago Booth. Um, is there an official, officially written down diversity policy? And I guess like also one question that is in a lot of our minds um, is given uh, the uh, the proceedings with respect to diversity and accusations of racism at U Chicago last year. Um, are there any measures taken to sort of um, um, basically, um, assure, at least provide some assurances to people coming from the community who are especially uh, marginalized uh, even within the profession? Great questions. So for your question about recruiting and our diversity and inclusion statements, we do not currently have any written policies beyond the uh, university uh, policies and rules and the different laws that we have to follow regarding hiring, uh, hiring processes. We do have a diversity and inclusion committee that was started at Booth this year that is working on uh, articulating some of those values and policies, but they have not currently produced any written document. Uh, that would guide uh, these sorts of decisions. So that is something that is forthcoming. Uh, you're right that there has been some negative press around the economics department in particular uh, in this area last year. And it's something that certainly we at Booth have taken very seriously. Uh, one of the things that we have that's a blessing having a program as large as we do is that it's been resourced uh, with staff who have direct responsibility for it. So that's me and uh, my colleague, Michelle, who also works uh, in my department. One of the things we try to do is to keep in close touch with all of our different research professionals and provide them with another pathway for redress for any situations that they encounter, which may be improper. It can be very difficult uh, for someone lower on the hierarchy in the academy to file any sort of complaint or have a difficult conversation about something that their faculty supervisor or that people around them may have said or done we do our best to be another source of redress where people don't have to be concerned about retaliation and we can provide some sort of redress for what they've experienced. Thanks so much, that was very reassuring. Uh, I guess like just as a quick follow-up, um, we were wondering um, if uh, Chicago does recognize caste also um, as, as an indicator of diversity, um, especially for applicants coming from India, uh, because uh, diversity could mean very different things uh, within uh, that sort of international context. We define diversity very capaciously here to the point that yeah. we actually don't have an individual list of characteristics that we consider as part of the application process. So we do our best when we are speaking to our faculty and introducing them to best practices uh, in hiring and recruiting to have them think as broadly as possible. So it could be questions of race and ethnicity, it could be questions of academic background, first generation status, low income status, all sorts of different areas that are underrepresented uh, in the profession. So I do not know of, again, a document that provides a specific list that would include something like CAST, but as a general principle, uh, we define uh, very capaciously the different areas that people are considering as they're hiring diversely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think there's a question about development econ opportunities at Booth. Um, and to answer that, I think currently Booth just has one development economist, Rebecca Dizon Ross, to the best of my knowledge, Stephen, again, I might be missing this. I know that people who have projects, I think Richard Hornbeck also has, Rick Hornbeck has like projects in India as well. But I think the only like self-identified development economist might be um, Rebecca Dizon Ross. And I know she hires like two RAs a year. Um, but I think U Chicago is in line to receive um, pretty massive funding for development econ because the Department of Economics recently, as you might know, um, Michael Kramer is moving to the Department of Econ. And as a result of that, there's also been like an influx of development, young development economists have been hired at the department and at Harris and stuff. 
So in general, I'd say U Chicago is going to have some sort of development econ movement coming up. What it looks like is anybody's guess at this stage, I think. Um, but there is soon going to be a development economic center here um, that Michael Kramer is going to be heading. Um, but at Booth particularly, I think there's like specifically at Booth, I think there's one um, economist who does hire two RAs a year. We circulated a form while for registration and some, we had some questions on MBA program and if you could comment on it, it would be great. I'm not entirely sure if MBA is your area of expertise, but we have multiple questions on MBA program. So I'll say the MBA program is not my area of experience, but I've done recruiting enough with a Chicago booth banner on my table that I've gotten my fair share of uh, questions about the MBA program. Uh, the most responsible thing I can do is actually just to refer you to our MBA office. They are very well staffed um, and they are eager to speak to anyone who's interested uh, in the program. I'm putting a link to them here in the chat. I think actually they just redid their website, so I don't remember entirely where the link is, but in the old website, it was around near the uh, bottom of the page. There was an opportunity to sign up for a, an opportunity to speak face to face uh, with a counselor in the MBA program and to learn more. Uh, so if you are interested in the MBA, I wouldn't necessarily call it a natural path toward a pre-doc or toward uh, a research career. Uh, we haven't had many people we have hired with that background. That is, certainly doesn't mean that we couldn't. Um, but if you are interested, that link is the place to check. Um, Stephen, is it possible to take MBA classes as a pre-doc? Like if you're not looking for the full degree, but if you like there's particular classes that are interesting to you? It is. If you're interested in classes in the uh, part-time evening weekend uh, or in the full-time program, yes, you could take those courses just as you could take any other course at the university. The tuition rate would be different. It's higher for the business school. Uh, but with the staff benefits that you have, especially if your professor were uh, willing or able to pay that other half of the tuition, uh, then that wouldn't be an issue. If we have more questions from the participants, we would love to entertain that. Otherwise, we are done with all the questions we have today. I have a question. Am I audible? Yes, uh, yeah, Stephen uh, mentioned, uh, you said uh, recruitment. I didn't get that. Uh, we are applying for the uh, course or we are applying for a job? Something like, because your recruitment means we are applying for a job in India. So a bit confused. So the pre-doc positions are full-time paid jobs. They are not part of a degree seeking program, you would not be students in this case. And that's generally true of pre-docs across the United States. So you'd be, you would be uh, applying for employment here at the university. Uh, how long is it for? The position is technically uh, not term limited. It's uh, an at will position. That said that positions typically last for two years before people decide to go on to graduate school or the next opportunity. And we do provide some language in the offer letters that say that that's the expected course, that it will take, technically we say one year with the possibility of a second year's renewal, but the general expectation is two years. And do we have to work from home in India or we have to come to Chicago to the campus? We do not allow remote work for this uh, position. And in fact, for outside the United States, we cannot legally support it. Uh, so we would require people to be working from campus. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Nidhan, if you could uh, just briefly discuss a bit more about PhD opportunities after um, getting an opportunity at Booth, that would be great. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, so I think 
um, Booth helped in a couple of ways directly in the PhD process. I know there might be other PhD students here, and I think pathways to PhDs differ a lot. So again, everything I say, take with a pinch of salt, because uh, I know experiences differ a fair bit. Um, but I think, so being at Booth helped me in a couple of ways when it came to applying to PhDs. Um, one is that I think I can't overstate this, but one of the biggest advantages of being here was being able to go for these workshops and stuff, as I mentioned. And the reason behind that was it just enriches like your statement of purpose and things like that, because you are aware of what's going on at the frontier of research as it's happening. So very often you'll be exposed to research that's not even been published yet, or there's no working papers out there. No one's tweeting about it yet. So it's sort of helpful to get that information beforehand. And when you, it, it helps you sort of craft a better statement of purpose, because when you're talking about research that interests you or research that you would like to pursue further or papers that you, or research that you've been exposed to that you have criticisms of, it's just much easier to do that when you've been constantly exposed to that um, as just a part of your job. Like a lot of these workshops are at lunchtime. So you just take your lunch along to the talk and you have your lunch there and then you go back to work. So just as a part of your daily job, you're exposed to research and you don't have to like do that additional thing of working your day job or being a student full time and then going back in the evening and trying to read a paper, which is a bit more stressful, I'd say. Um, so when I applied to PhDs, what really helped me was also the fact that I got like two detailed letters of reference about my specific research ability. I think that's kind of hard in general to come by. And I think that's one thing that these RA ships are starting to become quite renowned for. Of course, now expectations also adapting. <laughs> There's been some talk about how like how RA letters of reference should be interpreted by PhD admissions committees. Um, but in general, I got two letters of reference that were like, that could give a detailed account of my research ability, right? So because even compared to when you're doing a master's thesis and stuff, you're still working with a professor who's advising like two or three other PhD students. So often even their interaction with you is a bit limited. Uh, so there's only so much they can say in your letter of reference. So it really helped that um, I could get these two people to talk about like the specifics and say that we were working on this project and he showed some aptitude here and he's usually on time and he's not like, a slow person in general. So these, these are all big thumbs up in your PhD application. Um, the other thing was that um, it really helped to be applying for a PhD surrounded by other people who are also doing the same thing in terms of information flows, in terms of collaboration, in terms of getting people to read your essays, um, and just like all around having some support as you go through this pretty stressful process. Um, it is a very stressful process right through like, I think September through to February was a pretty bad set of months, especially during the pandemic. Um, and what really helped was having like 10 other RAs with me who were doing the same process and I could speak to them and make sure that I'm not sort of missing out on anything basic. I could talk to them about my anxieties about the GRE and when I should schedule it and about the TOEFL and all of that. Um, so that, that was also pretty helpful. And then I think more than anything else, um, it is rather unfortunate, but academia still works on a fair bit of networking. Who writes letters of, letters of reference can make a difference. Um, and I think that definitely made a huge difference in my profile this year, given that it was a pandemic year and a lot of departments had cut down on their funding for PhDs. And the number of applicants also went up by like three times or something. So I definitely think having the credentials really helps um, if, um, if you're being entirely clear about how this process works. It's not a perfect process um, by like nowhere near being a perfect process and having those credentials really helped. Um, yeah, and I, another very like a massive factor that really helped me out was the um, having that salary as I was applying for PhDs. Um, because the PhD application process is ridiculously expensive um, between giving the GRE and sending out scores. Um, and especially when you're applying um, 
like now we're getting to the nitty gritties of it, but like applying with a dollar salary is very different from applying with like when you're earning in rupees and stuff like that. Um, this is not to say that like, I mean, is this something to plan ahead for is all I'm saying. Even if you don't like go to U Chicago or something, it's something to plan ahead for. It's one of the small, um, not a small thing, but it's one of those things that might um, come as a bit of a surprise when you actually start opening the, the PhD website pages and start seeing the application costs. Um, but yeah, in a, so that's like a whole bunch of ways in which being at U Chicago helped. I'm happy to talk about this in a lot more detail. I, I'm happy to leave my personal email ID if you're interested in applying for PhDs and stuff. I'm very happy to get on a call, talk about it, um, or like, yeah, like I'm happy to answer further questions. I can get my personal email ID here. If there are any other specific questions about the PhD, I'm happy to answer that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do we have other questions from our participants? If you have any doubts, please take this opportunity. How much mathematics important for pursuing PhD in financial economics? Um, I think I saw your question earlier as well. Um, sorry, no, that was another. Um, if you got mathematics classes, so usually when you apply for an economics PhD, um, they put it in terms of like the American system where I think you need to have like three semesters of algebra and two semesters of calculus or something like that. Um, essentially, you need to have like some college level maths and statistics classes um, for a PhD typically. You don't need to have like econometrics necessarily, but if you've got like at least some maths and statistics classes under your belt at the college level, that's helpful. Um, plus two might not be enough, it, yeah. If one have not studied mathematics at his college level, but he has the knowledge of mathematics, sufficient knowledge, adequate knowledge, will he be eligible for that course? My sense is that that's not, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. You might have to look for alternative ways to like get some sort of certificate. So I'm not sure how, I'm not currently aware of like all the online um, opportunities that are out there, but if you can get like some sort of, like open course certificate, which you do online or something like that, that would be very helpful. That would like definitely put you in the running, but you need some sort of certification. Proper mathematics certificate or statistics is enough? Um, for PhD in economics, you'd need both, I would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Nidhan, for joining us. I think we will have to wrap up this session. Thank you so much to Nidhan for making this uh, collaboration possible. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. If you have questions, you can reach out to them or you can uh, send your questions to us and we will um, send it to the experts here. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for this wonderful session. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah.